I trust that you're all well with the family and the ministry. Well, let's begin today in prayers. Father, mm -hmm. we thank you for this opportunity opportunity you had given us to come before you. We pray that your name be exalted and be glorified. Grant us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding through the teaching from your servants today that we will be blessed and your name will be glorified indeed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Well, welcome to the platform. If you're joining us from the platform TV, the platform TV and Facebook, welcome. Well, today is the final section uh, for the particular topic that our guests have been dealing with for the last, uh, you know, three sections. And we are so excited that we will be finalizing this as it has been a blessing to so many of us. I've got our testimonies and I've, I want you to keep those testimonies coming in, share your experience, share how this is being a blessing to you. Well, let's turn it over to Joel and Kathy as they come live from the United States. Blessings once again, uh, brother and sister, thank you for always making yourself available to be a blessing to us. Well, we can't wait to receive from the Lord today. Well, we're excited to be here, uh, Bishop God's Power. And for those watching, I want to remind you to uh, go to our website, GodSaveMyMarriageNow.com. And you can go there. You can, There's a lot of materials. You can get to our store. We have our two books in PDF or in physical books, but if you're, you know, in Africa somewhere, probably be better to order on, to do on PDF, but we have The Man of Her Dreams, The Woman of His, which is volume one, and that lays the foundation, the beginning as it digs up, you know, the Bible says that uh, we have to tear down and pull down in order to replant and rebuild, and then the second book is Living It and Loving It, which continues that process of rebuilding, and they're beautiful, beautiful books. The Man of Her Dreams, The Woman of His, Volume 1, is 240 pages, and Living It and Loving It is 372 pages. And then we have a 12-hour DVD set. Now, you can order that, that again as a physical DVD, but you'd probably rather get the login so you can log in on your computer. If you're financially strapped, depending you know where you live, you know, it's different things in different okay. countries that might be here in the States, just get us an email. And if you don't have any funds at all, we'll send you a link to the books, a PDF link. Uh, certainly, if you're you know able to afford it, go ahead and do that. It supports the ministry. But if not, we'll just send the links to you at no cost for the books. And um, it, we also love to receive everybody's email addresses so we can have you on our email list. We send out a, a video every day from our YouTube on email. All right. And we have three dogs in the background. And we have a visiting dog today, a German Shepherd. So you might... Might get a little barking in the background, hopefully not. But today, we're going to go through some theological things about teaching on marriage. And if you'll go back and listen to the previous broadcast, the one from last week, we share a lot of overall th overall ideas. And husbands love your wife, and wife loves her husband in return. But I want to just quickly touch on some of the things that as you're reading the Word or studying on marriage, you might trip over because things have been taught incorrectly in the body of Christ. We have a Facebook group called Marriage Mythbusters, and you can go in there or just go into our YouTube and type in Marriage Mythbusters, Joel and Kathy Davison. And we've done a lot of teachings on these various things. So today we won't be able to go in depth in them, but only to touch them. So last session we touched on Genesis 3.16. Now what you'll hear taught sometimes is you will hear people teach that the curse of sin was that a woman would have a desire for her husband, and that that word desire means that she wants to control him or rule over him. That's not what that means at all. Now, that teaching was back in the early 60s, and we thought it was pretty much gone. We've been teaching and correcting that ever since we wrote our first book 20 years ago, and you you didn't really hear it much, but suddenly it has a resurgence. Yeah. Suddenly on Facebook and YouTube, because there's people that just really don't understand 
that are commenting on marriage topics. And when people who don't really understand what the word teaches on marriage, when they begin to preach or to comment on marriage, they will often say things that are just uneducated. So in Genesis 3.16, that word desire, one of the reasons that people thought it was a bad word was because the Bible says sin lays at your feet and its desire is for you. Well, Strong's Concordance did a wonderful job on this word desire, that the word desire simply means a very strong reaching out and longing for to pull one into oneself. And in Genesis 4, it says you should rule over that. Well, yeah, we should rule over sin, desiring us to pull us into itself. We should rule over that with an iron fist. We should beat that thing down, man. We should smack it to the ground and step on it and try and trample it. However, Strong's did a wonderful job. As he went on to say, when this is between a husband and or between a man and a woman, it is a romantic desire. So we see the exact same Hebrew word in Song of Solomon 7.10, where it says, I am my beloved's and my beloved's desire is toward me. Now, you want to make note of these references so you can look these up on yourself later. And you'll have this recording to go back to. because It's difficult to get your mind changed from the wrong teaching to the right teaching. So you're going to have to go in the word, pull those scriptures up. Your immediate impulse will be the wrong idea. And then listen to us and we guide you through it. So we correct your thinking and you begin to look at it in the right way. The, when it, the, to, be, to learn something new or to be corrected about something can be a very wonderful thing. And the Bible says that every word of God is given by inspiration and is profitable for instruction or correction and righteousness. And so anytime you learn something new from the word, sometimes it's not that pleasant because it's embarrassing as leaders to have taught something incorrectly. And we were guilty of that. When our marriage was bad, our first 10 years of marriage, we've been married 40 years now, had 10 bad years, 10 great years, then wrote a book, been helping couples for 20 years. So we've had 30 great years, 10 bad years. During our bad 10 years of marriage, we taught marriage incorrectly. And it was very embarrassing. Three of those years, we were pastors of a church. And when we began to relearn the proper understanding of marriage from a theological, from a legitimate Bible perspective, we were embarrassed that we had uh, taught it incorrectly. So Strong's pointed out when this desire is between a man and woman, it's a romantic desire. So Kathy was born by God with yeah. a desire for her husband. This was not the curse. The curse was not that she had the desire. The desire is a good thing. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. But we need to embrace that desire, that it is a good thing. We get told that it's bad. To go to God for, for the attention. Go to God for uh, for anything that you need. But God allowed a husband to be uh, to allow Christ to live and love through him to the bride. God brought a husband in physical form here to be the hands and feet of Jesus, not to use his hands wrongly, your feet wrongly, his mouth wrongly, but to allow Christ to live in love through him to her. And that's a desire. Ladies, we need to be able to speak, speak those desires and husbands embrace it and go, absolutely. Instead of resisting that yeah. desire your wife has for you to love her and embrace her and for her to draw you into herself and for you to be one flesh, instead of resisting that and push her away, embrace that and welcome that you know i'm so reminded of uh, i think it's miles monroe that said when uh said that one night he was uh speaking at his church and how did he, he was speaking at a men's conference, men's conference. and it's like six thousand men yeah. and he said man you know i love to pray for people i love to pray for people to be rose from the dead i'll pray for anybody yeah he said but i told my church he said if you're in your hospital bed and your family calls me and says pastor my, my, you know, my husband, my father is, is on his deathbed. He's probably going to die. Would you please come pray for him to not die? He says, I'll come. I, I'll be, I'll be there. He said, but as I'm heading to the door, if my wife says, uh, Miles, I need your help with something. He says, I'm going to be conducting a funeral because I'm not, I'm going to put my wife first. I'm going to take care of her first. I'll come see you second. It might be too late. <laughs> yeah. And that's the legitimate, proper heart response of a husband towards his wife. So many times as ministers, though, we get so focused on ministry and what God wants that the that the wife and the children get put in the background. That's what happened yeah. in our world. Absolutely. So we need to make sure we have it in the proper 
perspective of Christ, that we're born again, on fire, devil, bash, and Christian. That's first. Second is your wife and your children. And third is what we do for God. So how is it that we would win the whole world but lose our family? You don't want to do that. So your family's got to be number one priority. So this desire God put in a woman's heart, think of it as a marriage manual. Yeah. And in your wife's heart, there's a marriage manual that you can read. It's put in there by God of how to love your wife. And how does your wife tell you what's in her heart with her tongue? The Bible says the tongue is as a pen of a ready writer yeah. and will write the word on, on the doorpost on our tablets of our heart. So as a wife speaks out of her mouth and lets you know as her husband, and for any wives listening, as you speak out of your mouth and let your husband know what you're needing from him, that's the marriage manual that God put in your wife's heart. That if we follow that marriage manual, we can go right into an outrageously happy marriage. Mm -hmm. But and you must be a safe place, husband. So many times we'll get wives that are afraid to speak up mm -hmm. because if they're afraid to speak up, they know very well they're going to get pushed back or they're going to be told, no, I'm not doing that. Or no, I didn't do that. Or um, they'll get some other or they'll get some kind of punishment that you should make your wife, your home a safe place. You say to your wife. Anytime I'm doing something that is very hurtful to you, um, that is not Christ-like to you, then I would like you to speak up and there'll be no pushback. Um, no, I didn't do that because it's possible that you may not have recognized that you did that. You may not understand that that hurt her because it wouldn't hurt you. So therefore, it couldn't possibly hurt her or that there would be some kind of punishment on the side. She would be put down, uh, told to be quiet or whatever the case may be. You let her know that she could come boldly to this throne here on this earthly level and is here with you her heart and that you're going to be that safe place. Absolutely. And it goes without saying our the message of the in the Bible about how marriage is to be conducted mm -hmm. is for a Christian marriage or good hearted people. Sorry, I think you muted. Uh, just just uh, some technical glitch here. Uh, let's wait for them to just uh, unmute one more time. Wow. I don't know how that happened. That's, that's, that's very strange. How, how, right. long have we been, how long have we been muted? What was the last no, thing you heard us say? Just now. Okay. Okay. All right. Perfect. So obviously, Perfect. if a couple gets married, they're not Christians, they're sleeping around with everybody, you know, and, and they get married and say a woman says to her husband, and she's not a Christian woman, you know, she says to her husband, hey, I want us to go get into a three way sex affair with the next door neighbor. Obviously, that's not the heart of God in that wife and not the marriage manual. So, you know, we use, use common sense. We're talking to Christian couples or good-hearted people. The, you know, the Word of God, the way it teaches marriage, even if you have a couple that they're not Christians, but you know, she's a good-hearted woman, and, and then she's going to have those desires for her husband to love yeah. her, care for her, spend time with her, care about her feelings, listen to her heart, and all the nice things that a woman would want her husband to do. Yeah. So the curse of sin is that this man who this woman so desires, that God put a desire in Kathy's heart, in your wife's heart, for for her husband and that this man who she so desires she just wants him to love her yeah that he will rule over her with an iron fist mm -hmm. and that ruling is like you're gonna you know he's gonna beat her down he's gonna step on her he's gonna crush her that's the curse of sin so as christian men we need to say to our wives i'll never rule over you a day in our life i redeem you from the curse of sin i'm gonna pray for you that you, that we won't you won't have pain in childbirth and i'm gonna pray for you that um you know, that you'll be redeemed from that curse of sin. And I'm also never going to rule over you. So if you ever feel like I'm trying to rule over you, just tell me and I will back up. I will stop attempting to rule over you. Yeah. All right. So let's go over to Ephesians. And by the way, we were sharing that story about uh, South Africa, which absolutely loved us. But we had the one church from night that was a Nigerian church yeah. in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And those young men didn't like us. As a matter of fact, they all got up and started walking out and the and yeah the the nigerian pastor who's a very short man it was funny because he got in front of everybody he's waving his hands going no brothers no brothers stay stay please stay <laughs> 
And, uh, but yeah, they didn't like us a whole lot. But um, one of the, before they all started exiting the building, one of them said, uh, Pastor Joel and Kathy, question for you. Is it, uh, I have a wife and children in Nigeria. Of course, he had a girlfriend in Johannesburg. And he said, is it okay if I take a wife here in Johannesburg? And we said, oh, the answer to that question is very simple. Is it okay for your wife in Nigeria to take a second husband? And of course, all the young Nigerian men are like, oh, no, no, I can't do that. I said, then you can't take a second wife. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we weren't addressing people that already had multiple wives. I don't, <clears throat> I don't want to mess with that. But um, maybe another conversation. But for a, a man who has a wife, no, you can't take a second wife unless you're going to let her take a second husband. Absolutely. And you say, no, I'm not going to let her do that. Well, then don't. It's, it's called male privilege. Yeah. Because for some reason in us men, the sin nature makes us feel like we should be able to do what we want, but our wife can only do what we want her to More do. Superior. <laughs> or superior. It's yeah. A, it's a, yeah, it's that rule over. It's that sin nature. It's that kill, crush, destroy. It's that man that comes home and says to his wife, you know, I spent $500 to buy such and so. And she says, well, we don't have money for that. We can't afford that. We got to pay the electric bill. We got to pay the, the, the water bill. We got to buy groceries. Well, I wanted to buy this, so I just bought it. Well, if he's allowed to do that, then so is the wife. And what would he feel like if she came home and said, I bought $500. I bought a $500 wedding ring. He'd be like, you can't do that. We have to pay the electric bill. We got to buy the grocery bill. So why should a man be allowed to do something without his wife's approval if she can't do it without his approval? See, male privilege is I'm superior to my wife. <clears throat> I'm better than her. And we have to flush that. That is the curse of sin. And that is men ruling over their wives. So we've got to get rid of male privilege and do things together as a couple. And that's what you know, that's what we want couples to do. So Ephesians 5.21. We'll go back a little bit before that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Be, uh, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms. That's how your life should be like on a daily basis around your home. Have Christian music playing, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. You want to have the life of God in your home. Absolutely. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So our day-to-day -day life behind closed doors, husband and wife, could be one of joy and relaxation and peace. There should not be strife in our marriages. The Bible says where strife is, there is uh, confusion in every evil work. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need that in any of our homes, especially well, in any of our homes, period, whether you're Christians or not, because we're all called the minister, period. So you don't need that in your home. So we need to keep that as positive as possible. Absolutely. So. And husbands living with your wife in an understanding way. Yes. That keeps peace in your home. It's amazing. It's wonderful. Yeah, it takes two people to argue. You know, if a husband does not argue with his wife, then it's not a fight. It's not an argument. If a wife says, honey, you really hurt me. And you just say, oh, thank you for telling me. What what can I do to fix this, help you feel better? That's not an argument. All right, so Ephesians 5.21. Submitting to one another in the fear of God. So you submit to one another. That's how you get an outrageously happy marriage. That's step one is you submit one to another. Now, the wrong marriage teaching has been that it's only the wife that submits to the husband, and a husband is not supposed to submit to the wife. So this is where, again, as ministers, you're going to really need to hear this because every time you read this verse, a verse, and you see the word submit, you're going to go back in your mind the way we are all trained, thinking, oh, it's my wife submits to me. I'm the leader. She's the follower. Mm -hmm. And that's unscriptural. The submission is mutual. It's a mutual submission. I'm talking about the areas of authority, boss, who makes the final decision. A, a man doesn't get to make the final decisions and be the the, the authority over his wife just because he's a male, just because we like to say it's because he stands up and goes pee. <laughs> yeah. it, we are one flesh, and that's what we have to have. If you're going to have an outrageously have to marry, happy marriage, you have to be one flesh. Yeah. So where things got messed up and where all of us were taught wrong, and most of us and most of you probably, if you've ever taught on marriage, you probably taught it wrong, is because you've gone to verse 22 where the English translation and Maybe whatever translation you look at it might say the same thing. Wives, submit to your own husbands to the Lord. So it says, submitting to one another in the fear of God, verse 21. In verse 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. When, when we went to write our first book, we had been living mutual submission for 10 years. 
And if we felt like God said, write a book, tell your story, tell it, I'll tell you about marriage. So as we're writing the book, I thought, Lord, what are we going to do? Because we've been living mutual submission. We have an outrageously happy marriage. But it looks pretty obvious to me that the wife is supposed to submit to the husband and not, not both ways, not mutual submissions. But we've been living mutual submission, and it fixed our marriage. We had hell when we were trying to live the wrong marriage teaching, which is that the wife is the only one that's supposed to submit. We had hell for 10 years. So we knew something was wrong with it. We didn't really know what. And so we just lived what was working. Um, and so as I was studying, I had the PC Study Bible. Now, I had always used the big Strong's book all, all my life up until then. Loved it. Yeah, loved it. Got the PC Study Bible. I went to hit this verse 521, submitting to one another. And it was Hupatasso. So make a note of that, Hupatasso. Kind of spelled just like it sounds, H-U-P-A-T-A-S-S-O submitting to one another in the fear of God. Then in 522, I went to the word submit and I clicked on that. But instead of hitting strongs to get the definition, I accidentally hit Thayer's. And Thayer's pops up and it says, there is no Greek word for in this spot. It was added, the word submit was added by the translators. I could not believe what I was saying. I about fell out of my chair. But no, no, this can't be wrong. I literally started to shake because all of our life, we had been taught that 522 said, wives submit to your husbands is under the Lord. So we were taught in our Bible school and everybody we ever heard taught about marriage that you submit, mutually submit at church. But when you get home, the wife submits to the husband. And so then I clicked on Strong's and it said, who I thought, oh my goodness, now we have a problem. Strong says, who is there? Thayer says it's not. Well, the Bible says, let there be two or three witnesses establish something. And so I, there was another concordance called the Young's Concordance. We didn't have that. I didn't have it in that PC study Bible. And this, is, again, was clear back in 1984, so I couldn't just look it up on Google or something. So I uh, drove 30 miles one way to a Christian bookstore. We got married in 84. Okay, I wrote the book in 2004. Right. Yes, this was 2004. Married in 1984, wrote the book in 2004. Thank you, Kath. Amen. Amen. That could work, you know. <laughs> yes, indeed. Hallelujah. So I drove 30 miles to this Christian bookstore. I was literally shaking. And I went in, pulled Young's Concordance off the count shelf, and I thought, this is going to be the decider because two or three witnesses. Strong says it's a, that Hupatas says in 522. Thayer says it's not. I opened up Young's Concordance. There is no word in Ephesians 522 where the word submit is. It was added by the translator. The word hupotasso is not there. So my lambs, so what does it actually say? It's beautiful. And you can see why Satan got in here and caused the translators to make a serious mistake of adding the word submit into 522. Because the powerful thing Paul was saying was submit one to another, husband and wife, mm -hmm. and wives be private and separate to your husband as oh, you God. are to the Lord. That means you give your heart to your husband, just like we Christians give our heart to the Lord. We Christians, we bride of Christ, give our lives to the Lord. Yes. We're the bride. Amen. The, uh, so why do we give our heart to the Lord? The reason we give our heart to the Lord as his bride, as the wife to Jesus, is because we realize what he did for us. He laid his life down for us. He gave us agape love. For God so loved the, the world that he gave his only begotten son. Agape love is all about giving. So when we as Christians realize what Jesus did for us, when we as unbelievers realize that that's what yeah. gets us born again, we go, oh, my lands. Wow, as a sinner, he died for me. Yeah. And he's leading me to repentance by his goodness. He died for me when I did nothing to deserve it. Jesus, thank you. You're so wonderful. You gave your life for me. What can I do for you? Take me on. Take me on yours. And we give our heart to him. Well, that's the picture of an outrageously happy marriage where I, as a husband, love Kathy so much that she goes, wow, Joel loves me so much. He lays his life down for me. He thinks about me. He blesses me. He listens to my heart. He meets my needs. What can I do for you, Joel? I give you my heart. I, I, I'm private and separate to you, Joel. I give my heart to you. Because she wants to, not because she has to. She does it because she wants to, just like we got saved because we wanted to, because we realized what Jesus did for us. Absolutely.
And of course, Kathy had hopped in any time. Last week we started and Kathy shared for about 10 to 15 minutes to get things started. That's how we minister. We go back and forth. Yeah, so you could talk anytime you want, babe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So verse 23, for the husband's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. Now, after we wrote the first book, people would challenge us and they would say, mm -hmm. what does it mean when the Bible says a man is the head of his wife? And we just came from it honestly. We said, look, I can't tell you what it does mean. I can tell you what it does not mean. Yeah. It does not mean he's the boss. It does not mean he's the final decision maker. You're supposed to be one flesh. You're supposed to be mutually submitted to one another. There's another scripture where, and I didn't make a note on this scripture, so make a mental note of this to go look it up later. But Paul told, uh, I believe, Timothy to, to have the, teach the younger women to manage the house well. Yeah. So you look up that word manage, and that word manage is oka despotius. Now, you go over into where Jesus gave the example about the master of the house sent the servants out to compel people to come in. Who's the master of the house? The master of the house was God. The word master of the house is oka despodio. It's the masculine form of oka despodios. So when Paul told Timothy to have the younger, tell the younger woman or tell the women to manage their house, why did our English translators choose a word like manage when over when it was talking about God, the word was master of the house? There, there's problems in the way that the people were thinking when they translated the Bible when it came to marriage. Because like, wait a minute, we can't call a woman master of the house. We're going to call her manager of the house because obviously the husband is the kingpin. Obviously, the husband's the boss. He's the authority. So all she can do is manage the house under his authority. All that's made up, uh, ministers. Uh, you you, you want to listen to what we're saying. All those ideas are made up. They're fantasies by a bunch of men. And then women picked the ball up, and women teach these wrong things now, too. But in the early days, like in the 60s, when this stuff was really being taught heavy, and it, we all got infected by it, it was a bunch of men. They just wanted to keep their wives underneath their feet, get their wives to shut up, leave me alone, quit harassing me. And so they 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 mistaught these things. And the ones translating the word, well, King James kind of set the stage. And if the men would have told uh, King James that his wives were supposed to be masters of the house, it would have been off with your head. So yeah. they had to be very careful. <laughs> so they didn't use that word, a master of the house, but it's the same word. You know, we have to let the Bible translate the Bible. We can't read a scripture and then go, oh, we think it means this. We have to say, what does the Bible translate that? That's why in Genesis 3.16, everybody got messed up because they didn't let the Bible translate the Bible. And here, people didn't let the Bible translate the Bible uh, in, in reference to a wife uh, just being a manager of the house. Well, what Greek word was that? It's the word for master of the house. You say, so a wife is the boss? No, it's a team. We're one flesh. See, we leave our mother and father. We cleave to another. That's we right. become one flesh. We lead the home together. It's a team leadership. It's a mutual submission. It's a mutual honor. It's a mutual respect. So the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church. So it says Christ is head of the church. Does that include wives? Yes. So think about what's being said here. Christ is the head of the church, male and female. Yeah. A husband is the head of his wife. They don't do the same job. The job that Christ has as head of men and women, male and female, he that's a different job than a, than a husband's job as head of his wife. Now, when Paul was talking about Christ being the head of the church, he wasn't talking about the boss or the final authority. Jesus is the authority over the church. Can I get a big, duh? <laughs> it's kind of a waste of words. We know he's the authority over the church. That's not what Paul was teaching here. Christ is the source of spiritual life and strength to the church, male and female, when we want to get spiritually fed, we go to the Lord to get our spiritual food. A little bit to our pastors, uh, you know, our leaders, but our main source of spiritual life comes from the Lord. 
And a husband and wife can feed each other a Absolutely. little bit spiritually. You know, I say to Kathy, hey, Kathy, what do you feel like the Lord is saying here? Or, hey, look at this scripture that, you know, God's showing look me. Look what Kathy. the Lord showed me today when I was reading the word. Or look what he spoke to me uh, when I woke up this morning. Then you find the scriptures that back it up. And so, yeah, that's no, wonderful. And But that's a distant second, you know, to each other being spiritual, uh, giving each other spiritual life. And our pa uh, your pastor or your pastors, you feeding your flock, you're a secondary source. If you're the only place your flock is getting spiritual food from, they're going to be in trouble. <laughs> and they're going to see you how many times a week, once maybe. And they're probably not listening half the time. If they got cell phones, they're probably texting somebody. <laughs> so, um, so Jesus is our source of life and strength spiritually. So this word head, write this down, it's the word kephale. In Greek, K-E-P-H-A-A-L-E, K-E-P-H-A-L-E. -E. And it means like the source, like the river, the head of a river where the life comes from. So out of Jesus comes the spiritual life for the church. Well, how is a husband the source of life and strength to his wife? That is in the emotional realm. Why do you think your wife gets angry if you ignore her? Yeah. Because you are killing her emotionally. You're not feeding her emotionally. Why is it that your wife gets happy when you start treating her great? The Bible says a husband, a man should make his wife happy. Matter of fact, the Bible says uh, that when they got married in the Old Testament, they would take a year off to be married simply so the husband could make the wife happy. Well, how does a man make his wife happy? By listening to her heart, yeah. By being with her, by valuing her, mm -hmm. by when you listen to her, you're showing her value. You're letting her know you care about what she thinks and how she feels, and, and that she's an intelligent person. And so that's important. That feeds life. Absolutely. So I feed Kathy emotionally. Mm -hmm. I'm her emotional source of life and strength. But yes, the joy of the Lord is still her strength. Yeah. She can still get some joy directly from the Lord, obviously. A single woman, her she gets everything like that from Jesus. But when she gets married, she now receives emotional life and strength, mainly from her husband. It's very difficult for a Christian woman who's married to a bad husband, even a Christian husband, Christian wife, but he is not treating her right. He's not being a husband, a good husband. He's not listening to her heart. And she's trying to be happy in Jesus. Mm -hmm. She'll probably get weird. That's what happens here in America. And they'll be floating around the front of the church telling everybody they're married to Jesus. Well, aren't you married to a husband too? Yeah, but he hasn't come to church, but I'm married to Jesus. He's my husband. No, your husband's at home. So uh, if a wife's husband is not feeding her emotionally, she will start to get problems happening. The, the the wife that gets kind of weird spiritually, that's the best of bad reactions. Other women will get into adultery. Other women will get cancer, fibromyalgia, all kinds of diseases. The stress of the situation affects your immune system um, and affects your body. So that's when Joel says that she gets all these other things. It affects her in different ways. Absolutely. When a Christian woman has a Christian husband, he's mistreating her. Sometimes it'll she'll end up backsliding. She'll get bitter. She'll get hard. Why? Because she is being starved to death by her emotional source of life and strength. And see, in our bad days for 10 years, Kathy would literally beg me to pay attention to her and to show her love. And I would yell and scream at her, leave me alone, get away from me. And I would yell at her. I'd say, go to Jesus, go to Jesus, talk to Jesus, quit putting me under all this pressure. Well, I found out it was no pressure when I started actually doing that actually listening to Kathy, actually loving her, yeah. it wasn't hard at all. It was like, oh my gosh, I could have been doing this for 10 years instead of being an idiot. <laughs> I was a good idiot. <laughs> I was an idiot. They could lay hands on the sick and they recover. Blind eyes would open, but man, I was an idiot. I'll and tell you what. <laughs> when he did that, he thought God was validating his character, <laughs> but he wasn't validating his character. That person needed a miracle and God was willing to use whoever was in front of them to get that miracle. So he was good at what he was doing, which was mistreating me, but God still used him in the process. But you don't want to be that that minister that where God uses you, even, even if you have a bad character or that you're a, a husband that is not great to your wife and look like Christ to your wife, allowing Christ to live and love through you. 
You don't want to be that mean. Go, well, all that matters is that when I pray for the sick and I see them recover, that's all that matters. No. Husbands, love your wife like Christ. You are to love your wife. She is, when you stand before our Heavenly Father, when you stand there, you want to hear him say, well done. You took care of my daughter. You took care of the person I gave you. And, and be, you know, and he'll be proud that you took care of him. So you want to be better. You want to be better. Absolutely. Amen. So we are the source of emotional life and strength to our wives. So wives, open up to your husbands and let him feed you emotionally. And again, if your husband's not treating you right, coach him. We just sent out an email, connected our video on YouTube about wives coach your husband. A wife coaches her husband on how to love her so that you feel loved, you feel strength, and you feel supported emotionally because that's where your source of life and strength emotionally comes from. And if you're not in your marriage, if your marriage is, has not been good or great or whatever, and you don't feel safe enough to speak up to him, say, you know what? Well, we've been learning on this on this Zoom and stuff about marriage and stuff. I'm going to be brave enough to say, I need to share how I feel. So I really need you to be a safe place right now. I nearly need you to allow Christ to live in love through you with love and be able to share how you feel and then that way a husband can step in and go, okay, yep. this could be a little difficult hearing her tell me what I'm doing wrong or something that has hurt her, but I want her to tell me. So ladies, if you need to speak up and just say that, then please do that. So that way um, she can feel safe enough to be able to speak. You don't want to be one of those couples where your wife shuts down. You don't want to. Matter of fact, we've been telling a local guy here, you don't want to be in that that place where your wife hates you and won't talk to you anymore. And it's like you're climbing Mount Everest, a very tall place to, you know. Um, but you don't want to be that guy. Well, he was listening until he didn't listen. And then his wife got very, very angry to where she was shutting down and saying, I want a divorce. And now he's on that side that I told him he didn't want to be on. But we're hoping to get that little ship turned around here. So hopefully we'll get back to listening. Yeah. So submit one to another. Wives, give your heart to your husband like you give your uh, heart, like we all give our heart to the Lord, because your husband is where you get your emotional life and strength from. Yeah. And if you're not receiving from him, you're going to start to dry up and bad things will begin to happen. And that's either because a wife isn't receiving or asking her husband to love her and to make her feel good and bless her emotionally, or because he's unwilling to do it. Therefore, as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives speak to their husbands and everything. Obviously, it doesn't mean everything. If a husband says to his wife, uh, hey, let's go out and have a three-way with somebody, obviously, she's not going to be subject to her husband. Let's go do drugs or whatever. Or, or go get or, drunk or whatever. Yeah, or he tells her, you know, quit going to church. Or, yeah. Yeah, or no, I, no, we're not going to tithe, and don't you dare take money out of the bank and tithe or whatever. No, she's not supposed to be subject to her husband like that because it's not talking about that type of thing. Right. It's talking about the emotions. And so a, the, the Christian women have been taught incorrectly for many years, don't respond to your husband when he mistreats you. Just love him, pray for him, submit to him, follow his leadership, and respect him. That's completely unscriptural because she's not being subject to him emotionally. If your husband's mistreating you, let yourself feel bad and tell him about it. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to allow yourself to be affected by your husband, and you're supposed to allow yourself to be affected by your husband to the good. So as your husband begins to treat you properly and treat you the way you're asking him to, you allow yourself to respond to him by getting happy and giving your heart to him and loving him in return. And when he loves you, you're loving him back. He's treating you good. You're treating him good back. Now, there are um ditches on both sides of the road when we're going along here because sometimes you'll get a husband that doesn't treat his wife good at all for two or three days then he treats her good two or three days mm -hmm. and we call it then bad and then good and then bad and then good and that's a jekyll hyde form of abuse yeah you know this is we really to do this justice we have a 26 hour weekend we've got two books dvd set so you know to we're, we're giving you stuff quickly trusting you're going to go and really let god unfold these things for you in your mind. So uh, husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church as verse 25 and gave himself for. So this word love is agape love. Husband, love your wife with agape love. That means just like Jesus dying on the cross. Sometimes it doesn't feel good. Sometimes your wife says to you, honey, would you come and spend time with me, please, or help me with the children? 
And you don't want to, man. Yeah. You want to study the Bible. You want to go talk to somebody about Jesus. The last thing you want to do is stop and spend time with your wife and children. What do you do? You know, lay your life down for your wife. You be Christ-like. That's what it means to love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. Yeah. Jesus gave himself for his wife to the point of death. You know, guys here at America will say, oh, I would take a bullet for my wife. I'm like, H-E double toothpicks, you'd take a bullet for your wife. You won't even come home from work on time uh, when your wife asks you to. You tell her that you'll come home when you're good and ready. You're going to stop the convenience store and flirt with the girls and be home half an hour after work, after you get off work, instead of instead of 10 minutes after or you get off work. do something like take out the trash or help her with this project or that project. Yeah. You say you'll do anything, but really, because when she does ask you, if you don't do it, you're not really being honest when you say that. Yeah. You're only saying, I'll do anything, only what I want to do. Yeah. And do it right away, guys. Don't tell your wife. If your wife says, hey, honey, could you come help me with this? Don't say, let me finish what I'm doing and I'll come help you. That makes you a good guy, but it doesn't do anything for your wife. And we're just talking scientifically here. And it's a whole nother teaching. Mm -hmm. Again, go on our YouTubes and our Facebook. We have a lot of teachings on there. You can learn about all this stuff in detail. But there's a chemical called oxytocin. It makes your wife feel good. It feeds her emotionally. It's the feel-good uh, hormone. It makes her like you. If she asks you to do something as simple as taking out the trash, if you do it immediately, her yeah. body releases oxytocin. That's how God created her because you're laying your life down for her. When you lay your life down for her, you do something that she's asking you to do that you don't want to do. That's the definition of laying your life down for your wife. Mm -hmm. Then she gets oxytocin from that, which makes her feel good, gives her health makes her physically healthy and causes her to like you more. So instead of just being a good guy and doing it five minutes later, just do it right away so you can get the benefit and your wife can get the benefit of getting a shot of the good stuff. A shot of the oxytocin. Absolutely. Amen. See, every, even science backs up the Bible. That says, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her, that he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water uh, by the word that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but she should be holy and without blemish. So how do we cleanse our wives? That's not preaching the word to our wives. That's not teaching a Bible study to our wife. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the word and God are one. God is love. So how do you cleanse your wife with the washing of the water of the word? You cleanse your wife with the washing of the water of loving your wife because God is love and God and the word are one. God is love. Love is what draws her. Love is what causes her to want to be with you. It's not because she has to. You know, we want to serve the Lord. You know, God gave us a choice. But so he we really wanted to. So that's how it is with the husband and wife. You so love your wife that she wants to be with you. That, you know, if you're engaged and you ask her to marry you, she's given a choice to either say yes or say no. So you want her to say yes. So you love her. So she'll say yes. But then you continue loving her after that. Marriage is just dating for life. It's just dating for life. Absolutely. Continue dating. Never stop dating. Don't stop the flowers. Don't stop your dates. Don't stop your dinners out. Don't stop your picnics inside your house. If you do picnics inside your house, don't stop dating. It's just married for life with benefits. Absolutely. You know, the benefits we're not supposed to do before we get married, that. So then we keep on dating for life with benefits. So, A pastor recently said to us, he said, you know, before couples get married, I'm trying to get them not to have sex. Yeah. After they get married, I'm trying to get them to have sex. Crazy. Some couples, once they get married, they quit having sex. Don't let that be you. Don't let that be you. No, no, no. That actually causes that bonding to take place and be more of that one flesh relationship. So, yeah, um, yes. Amen. So he who loves, uh, he who loves, the husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. Have you ever heard a man say, oh, I just don't like myself. I got to deal with my stuff. I got to work through my issues first before I can love my wife. No, that's wrong. You love your wife. You love yourself by loving your wife. You don't love yourself by what we call affectionately navel gazing. Oh, it's all about me. I got to think about me. It's all about me. No, you love yourself by loving your wife coming out of yourself. 
You're breaking the selfishness. You're breaking the self-focus and focusing out on your wife. Then you and your wife focus out, bless the children and, and think about them. You see the never ending tunnel of a husband saying, I can't love you till I first love myself. That could go on for eternity. I mean, it's a never ending thing because if he doesn't want to do this, he'll stay on this path. And so it has to be that a husband goes, I love myself by loving my wife. Now he's focusing out. And as he focuses out, he gets healed. She gets healed. Now you're one flesh relationship. But we have had those guys that sit back and say, I can't love her um, until I love myself. Well, how long is that going to take? I don't know. A few months, a year or two. I don't know. It's a never ending thing. So how about if we stop the I don't know and just focus on loving your wife. And so now you get healed quickly. She gets healed. And there you go. Absolutely. Amen. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So nourish and cherish your wife. Agape love her and nourish and cherish her. For we're members of his body is flesh and bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife. The two become one flesh. That's that one flesh we've been talking about. Yeah. You notice it does not say for a wife to leave her mother and father. Yeah. Why doesn't it say for a woman to leave her mother and father? Because she she might need protected from that husband. You know, if you have it, well, good. I, I go ahead. Yeah. Say, if say you that again. if you have a daughter that marries a bad guy and he starts to mistreat her, you as her parents are still her protective authority and covering where you can go in and if she's willing to allow you, you can pull her out of that situation and bring her back under your protection and authority. And you can tell that young man. You're going to straighten out. You're going to call Joel and Kathy and go through their program and, and learn how to be a husband, or you're not going to get our daughter back because you you don't give up your protective authority and covering over your daughter when she gets married because she was never told by the Lord, by the Bible. This scripture is repeated three times. If something's really important, it'll be repeated three times in the Bible. This is verbatim three different times in the Bible. And not once is a wife told to leave her mother and father to cleave to the husband. That's right. Again, why? He might be a bad husband. He might start abusing her. And if he does, her parents need to rescue her and protect her. And say, I thought she came under her parents' authority. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. When she got married. And you have a picture of an umbrella. If you've ever seen these pictures of umbrellas, throw those things away. It's all garbage. It's all made up. It's a That umbrella picture was originally created by a pedophile. Uh, his name was Bill Gothard, and he's uh, I'm sure dead now. But many years ago, he was a pedophile, a single man, and he taught this idea that when uh, a girl's young, she's under her parents' protective covering, under the umbrella of authority, which is true. But when she gets married, she now goes under her husband's protective umbrella of authority. And if she doesn't submit to her husband, if she doesn't follow his leadership, if she disrespects him, then she's going to be out of God's will and the devil can get her. That man was a pedophile. So don't listen to that teaching. It's completely 100% wrong. Now, well, so that teaching is why help keep me in abuse. So that's just flat out. Yeah. Thank God it's, you know, we need to walk away from that. Yeah. So submission, mutual submission does infer mutual authority. Kathy has authority over me. I have authority over her. But until her parents were dead, they still had authority over her ultimate authority more than I did if I mistreated her. If I'm mutually submitted to Kathy, if we're if we're mutually under each other's authority, then that's great. That's wonderful. The wrong teaching is saying that the man is the authority and the wife is under him. End of story. If you say, OK, the, the wife's under the husband's authority and the husband's under the wife's authority. We're in mutual submission. That is the truth. How much time is left? Yeah, and let us know there, uh, Bishop, how much time we have left. I want to get as much as I can in on these Nine theological minutes. questions. How many? Nine. Nine. Okay, beautiful. So going on down, verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ in the church. We figured the mystery out, and that's what we're teaching you. The mystery is this. Just like Christ gave his life for the church, we men give our life for our wife. Just like we as Christians, male and female, give our life to the Lord, uh, a woman gives her life to her husband in response to him treating her great. Just like we give our life to Jesus in response to him treating us great. Jesus leads us, the body of Christ, male and female, to repentance by his goodness if we get out of line. 
if a wife gets out of line and his husband doesn't have authority over her, tell her what to do, what not to do, what does he have to do? He has to do what Jesus does, lead her to repentance by his goodness. He has to treat his wife so good that her heart starts to want to come back to him yeah. and do the right thing. You know, God could force us all to do the right thing, but he doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. He leads us by his goodness. And verse 33 Nevertheless, that each one of you in particular so love his own wife. This again is agape love. You'll notice in this passage, there's three times that husbands are told to agape love their wife. Verse uh, 33, verse 28, and verse 25, that we're told to love our wife. That's agape love. You notice the wife is not told to agape love the husband. Go through the New Testament and find, try to find every time that a wife is told to love her husband. It's only one time. And it's not the word agape, it's the word philandrous. And we talked about that last week, but I want to bring it back in here. Philandrous is responsive love. We love him because he first loved us. Yeah. A wife loves her husband because her husband first loves him. We treat our wife great, she treats us great. Let each of you in particular so wife love his own wife, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. This is another one of these verses that was horribly mistranslated. It's like Satan, if he if he could attack God, he'd get blown to smithereens. He's going to attack Jesus directly, get blown to smithereens. Who does he hate? He hates women because the, the enmity is between the woman and Satan. So Satan could attack women directly, but you know, women are pretty tough spiritually. Well, if he can go through a man and destroy a woman, because we are her source of emotional life and strength, yeah. that's where he can really hurt a woman. So he messes us up as husbands so he can destroy our wives through us. And so the mistranslations in the Bible are all things that hurt women. So this word respect is the word phobio. And again, you're all going to hear the wrong teaching. So I hope you're writing this stuff down because you're, you're going to have to go and really do some brain renewing and cleansing of the wrong teaching. You've all heard a husband's to love his wife and a wife is to respect her husband. A man's number one need is to be respected. A woman's number one needs to be loved. Bunk. That whole book, throw it away, called Love and Respect. That word respect here is phobio. Phobio is fear. The Bible says, let the Bible translate the Bible. Yeah. Perfect love, perfect agape love, which is what a man's supposed to do for his wife here in verse 33. Let a man, let you, so love your own wife with agape love. Perfect love casts out phobio. So why is a husband supposed to love his wife in verse 33? So she is not afraid of him. Because women were petrified of their husbands back in these days. If a man divorced his wife, she was on the street with nothing, penniless. I mean, Caputo. Women weren't before Jesus came and Paul, came, Paul uh, started helping women and, and Peter started helping women. Before all that, women couldn't go to church. They couldn't go to school. I mean, they were like nothing. They were less than dogs. When Paul told men to give your life for your wife like Christ gave his life for the church, that's like blasphemy. What are you talking about? My wife is like our family dog. You want me to lay my life down for my dog? No, it's just a dog. Well, that was the attitude about women back then. It's just a woman. I don't need to lay my life down for her. She's got to get rid of her. Give me another one. Who cares? You know, that's why Paul said, you know, be a husband and one wife because some of the men had multiple wives back then. And you don't want to do that. Um be one good husband and one good wife, which is one yeah. wife, one Be good husband, one wife. Be the best at that. <laughs> yes, don't spread yourself so thin here, you know. Absolutely. Just focus in, be the best husband, and be the best team so that those looking on can look and go, I want to be just like them. What is it that you have that I don't? Then you're able to share Christ and be able to share on what God has done for you and what he continues to do and what he can do for them. To be the best husband. Yep. And first Peter 3 7. I want to do this real quick because again, it's going to trip it'll trip you up and you'll you'll hear all the wrong teachings. You've probably all heard the wrong teachings. But mm -hmm. first of all, first Peter 3 1 says if you're if a woman's married to an unbeliever, she can win him to the Lord without a word, a meek, quiet spirit. That's a that's a man who's disobedient to the word, which in those days meant he wasn't saved. This doesn't mean if you're a Christian woman married to a Christian man and he's acting like an idiot. No, you don't have a meek, submissive, quiet spirit. You stand up to him and you tell him what he's doing wrong. What he needs to fix, you got to be his helper. You got to help that man become a Christ like godly man. If he doesn't listen to you, you got to get some help. Get our help, get Bishop's help, find find other people who will help you to get your husband's attention. That's right. So 1 Peter 3 7 says, Husbands, dwell with your wife with understanding. You got to understand your wife, and we're helping you to understand things about your wife. As to the weaker vessel and being, okay, with, uh, yeah, giving honor, sorry. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife 
as to the weaker vessel and being heirs together of the grace of life. First of all, where's a wife a weaker vessel? Obviously, physically, as we found out in the Olympics, but also in the this emotional realm of I affect Kathy. If I'm if I'm treating Kathy bad, she's trying to be strong emotionally. It's not going to work. She needs to get me to treat her right. But this word honor, honor your wife. Some guy says, no, I'm the boss. I'm I'm above my wife. I have a higher authority than my wife. There's only one verse in the entire New Testament that teaches that a husband or wife has a higher rank. And that's this word honor. And that is husbands honor your wife as if you're honoring somebody higher in rank than you. Now, we don't teach that a wife is higher in rank than a husband because you can't build a doctrine on one verse. But if the Bible only has one time that actually says that a husband or wife is higher in rank, that is a husband is to honor his wife as if she is higher in rank than he is. That's how much honor we men are to give our wives. I know somebody might be listening thinking, man, you guys twisted everything. No, we untwisted everything. Everything we have to do to get a marriage outrageously happy is untwist all the wrong teaching. And again, you can go to our YouTube, our Facebook, Marriage Mythbusters Youth Group, our youth, Facebook youth group, is, Marriage Mythbusters Marriage Group, group Marriage Group, <laughs> Facebook group on, yeah, group on Facebook, and uh, a YouTube, Joel and Kathy Davison. It's one where Kathy's standing behind me and we're, Kind of like that. We've got a couple other YouTubes. We have, we have a lot of videos. You'll know you're the right one if you find a lot of videos on there. Look at these faces. Yes. And uh, if you, there's only eight videos, that's the wrong YouTube channel. No videos, wrong YouTube channel. Our website, again, is God Save My Marriage Now. And please, if you have questions, because this normally stirs up a ton of questions, send them to Bishop. Bishop can compile them. He can have us come back again just for the purpose of answering questions. We'd be happy to do that. We can answer every question. We've been doing this. 20 years helping couples full-time, 30 years of an outrageously happy marriage. We can answer every question you have. You're not going to ask us a question and stump us. You know, we'll help you. We'll help you to understand so you can properly teach marriage to your people. Amen. If you can have an outrageously happy marriage. If Joel and Kathy could do it, so can you. That's our motto. Back to you, Thank Bishop. You. Thank you so much, brother. Wow. Such a powerful word again today. And, um, you know, I'm sure there is a lot of questions, but I'm going to get those across to you as I receive them and possibly bring you in for a question and answer section. Yeah. Uh, cool. I've got some that I'm compiling during the course of your teaching, and it is very clear uh, that, you know, you can, you can read the scripture and without deep research, you could be misled. Yeah, uh, especially concerning that. A lot of people do not understand this, that, you know, every word in the scripture, just because it is the scripture does not sensitively mean they are all complete. There are some words that are hardened by those who rewrite the scripture. And some were taken off. And, you know, you brought that clarity today because, you know, especially in Africa, you realize that submission is, is in another tense, is in another way. It, it, it is being viewed, you know, contrary to what you have shared. And I've got yeah. so many questions coming in already uh, as you were teaching. And the need to bring you back is here. We would we would want to bring you not to teach, but just to answer questions, maybe in the next month, where you begin to align these things on the scriptural terms and of course the view of what the scripture says. Uh, because what you must understand also is that globally we have cultural differences. We have so many things that is going on in Africa, that is not happening in America, and possibly happening in Asia, that is not happening in Europe. So we want to bring all these to scriptural contents so that people get to understand that what you're teaching is the truth. There is no contradicting words from every single words you have taught because they are scriptural. 
as you are teaching and making research and I'm trying to equal them to every statement that you have made. And I discovered that they are all scripturally based, apart from the fact that so many people just want to be in power and, and, and mm -hmm. power investigate and it can actually destroy your marriage and destroy mm -hmm. your ministry before you even wake up to reality. And, and it brings us back to the scripture that if a man cannot lead his home, I mean his home, how can he lead a ministry? So pastors, leaders, each and every one of you connected to this platform, please write your questions. Don't be too righteous about this. There is a lot going on in our marriages and some of us are unable to lead our home, but we are messiahs in the church. We are being looked up to, we, we're ruined more than everyone wants to be like us, but our wife or our husband does not want to look like us at all. And this is where it is important that we come together and ask questions where we need help so that we are able to build our marriages as well as our ministry. And look at this, your home comes first before the ministry. The ministry does not come first. So it is better to build your home before you build the ministry. So let's change the focus. Let's change our attention and take this teaching, you know, very serious and not just politely and start doing certain things right again in our home. And that way, how ministry will flourish and blossom to the glory of God. So I look forward mm -hmm. to getting your questions. You can drop them on my WhatsApp. You can drop them if you're watching on Facebook. Just drop them on the comment section. If, you want, if you're here at Zoom, please drop those questions there. I've seen quite a, a number of questions that have come in already. And I'm going to tell you again when Joel and Katie will be here to answer your questions. May God bless you all. And thank you so much for joining us today. Look forward to be with you again, same time, same link, same place on Monday. And until then, have a blessed and supernatural service on Sunday morning. Bye for now.